so while Adam is um, getting set up here, it gives me a chance to acknowledge and thank him for bringing us together for this event. And we're looking forward to hearing a little bit about rubidium, I'm sure, and maybe a little bit about a hydrogen at the end. Oh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? So it's been a, it's been a long day. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, I think, uh, thank you for your, for your, thank you, Elizabeth, but you should also remember to thank Hussein, who has been instrumental in making this possible. Um, so we've, I, when I first arrived here uh, at the end of October, really our big plan was to, to look at rubidium and try to figure out how one could excite these, these states. Uh, now, it, it, it took us a surprising, uh, surprising long time to, to actually gather sort of the moral courage to actually tackle this problem. And so, in fact, uh, we've only really been looking at it for, for a few weeks. And so I will tell you, um, I will start off with, with uh, our previous work with, with, uh, with hydrogen and so forth. I will start with that as a background. And then, and then towards the end, we'll, we'll look at um, uh, alkali halide systems and then, and then finally rubidium too. So, uh, the, the, in particular, the rubidium work is done in collaboration with, with Seth and Hossein here at, at ITAMP, and of course we've been talking a lot to, to the Yukon people. Um, so, for me personally, when I became interested in this problem was when I saw uh, Ubach's uh, experiment uh, some years ago now, and I found it absolutely fascinating that you could have these Rydberg-like systems that actually were heavy Rydbergs rather than electronic Rydbergs. So I had sort of grown up Think, well, not growing up as a small child, but later on, you know, as a PhD student, thinking about Rydberg states. But, but in fact, I was always thinking about electronic Rydberg states. And here was something that was very similar, yet, yet different. And so in both cases, uh, the, the dynamics is really um, uh, controlled by a long-range Coulomb interaction. And so that gives the, the same sort of uh, general universal scaling laws. But the difference is that in one case you have an electronic state, in another case you have a vibrational state. And so, of course, uh, vibrational states we, we deal with differently. And, um, and of course, um, they're not exactly the same because the, the effective mass is, is extremely different, as we heard through the talks today. And, and this does make a difference. So, in an electronic state, like, uh, say, the hydrogen atom being sort of archetypical, the, as you go up in, in quantum number, very quickly you're in a very small, narrow energy band just below the, the ionization limit. And even in the, in the lightest possible heavy Rydberg state, the, the reduced mass is a factor of 1,000, so three orders of magnitude higher, which, which has the effect of, of spreading out your, your energy levels much, much more. And so it, it takes simply much more time or many more sort of steps up the, the principal quantum number until you reach a region where you have these kind of universal scalings. And that's, I think, also what we've been seeing. Uh, from a sort of theoretical scattering point of view, um, one reason, for instance, why quantum defect theory works so well is the fact that you are in this narrow energy band. And so really the, all the inter short range interactions are are very weakly dependent on, on going from one quantum number to another. And that can be seen looking at the, at the wave function of the, of the electron. So, so these are, are three wave functions, one for 100, principal quantum number 200 and 300. And you see at short range, they're very, very similar, which then translates into the short range interactions being very, being very similar. Now, with a factor of 1,000 scaling on, on the mass, the, the same three wave functions are, are widely dissimilar and be in and out of phase already before you reach sort of six, eight atomic units of, of distance. And so, so having strongly energy dependent uh, quantum defects and things like that isn't really surprising because you simply, it takes time to reach uh, that kind of uh, Rydberg domain. So that's, that's sort of just a general, general caveat, I guess. And, um, and of course now, so we're saying that these, these, these are vibrational states. And vibrational states with a very long range Coulomb component have been investigated theoretically for quite, quite some time. And so already back in the, in the 70s, people were looking at these and, and, and they were particularly interested in alkali halides. Uh, I guess one reason for this is that it's actually a very beautiful theoretical example of a, of a simple interaction between a covalent and ionic state. And so you have really a kind of isolated a crossing that 
is, is very attractive uh, to treat theoretically. And, and so a lot of the initial uh, sort of theory on um, non-adiabatic dynamics with a single uh, a crossing was, was done by Mark Child and Alex Dalgarno, who did the sort of proper quantum mechanics, and of course many other people. And then in the early 80s, uh, Frederick Mies uh, realized that one could use uh, MQDT-like techniques, a multi-channel quantum defect theory-like techniques, to treat also vibrational systems. And so that was uh, uh, sort of, a, I think, a conceptual uh, nice leap in terms of how one can do theory. Then uh, in the early 90s, uh, Volker, uh, Volker Engel was doing wave packet dynamics. Uh, again, in sort of alkali halide systems and very much inspired by experiments uh, done by Ahmed Zavail. So there was a sort of birth of femto, femtochemistry. And then uh, um, at the end of the 90s, uh, Sadegpour and, and colleagues uh, investigated the lithium fluoride, combining close coupled equations with, with MQDT. And that's very similar to what I've been doing uh, recently with, with these uh, heavy Rydberg states. And so that kind of approach essentially um, uh, uses, um, solves the close coupled equations at small internuclear distance. So you really just do a scattering calculation. And uh, I use the logarithmic method. So at this stage, it's almost, or it is essentially identical to say what, what OSA is doing. Um, and then what we, what we add is another layer that allows us to look at the very long range resonances. So if this is our in a region where we, where we do the scattering calculation, then we want to be able to, to conveniently examine very long range resonances in the closed ion pair channel. And, and doing that with a sort of uh, MQDT like uh, approach is, is very convenient. So, so, to show that in a bit more detail, uh, essentially we start with a coupled equation for, for uh, nuclear motion. And so you have the, the first derivative uh, coupling, uh, second derivative term. Uh, and uh, the first thing you do is you eliminate, you go into the diabatic basis in order to calculate that. And so that's what also called the, the strict diabatization. Uh, I wanted to comment, like in a sense, uh, for me personally, the fact that these uh, diabatic potentials from the, the strict diabatization that they don't look very physical is not so much of a worry because for, for me it's more of a, of a technical tool. So when you solve the, the closed coupled equations, what you do, you, you construct a, a, a solution uh, analytically for each step and essentially you need a diagonal uh, Hamiltonian at that, at that, uh, for each step. And so essentially you have a locally a diagonal um, a basis at each step, but it's really mo mostly a mathematical tool to construct a solution that steps from the inside to the, to the outside of the solution. So also what we do, this is called the log derivative method, and it comes from the fact that we don't propagate the wave function, but actually propagate the log derivative matrix of the wave function. This has the advantage of, of the solution being stable when we have closed channels, and it was uh, pioneered by people like uh, David Monopoulos and so forth in, in uh, uh, reactive scattering. Uh, you could also use something like uh, renormalized numerov. So I, I guess my point is that, that all of this is sort of um, uh, the, the, the standard toolbox of, of reactive scattering and, and quantum uh, mechanical chemistry. Now, what we can do eventually, once you've propagated your, your solution to a large enough distance, is you, you, you can fit a, a scattering matrix. And uh, that will give you your resonances, your differential cross-sections. And uh, here we do things a little bit differently from, say, OSA, because we, we fit um, a short-range matrix that doesn't yet have all the long-range resonances in it. So we propagate as far out as to be able to ignore the, the short-range couplings, but then we stop and we uh, account for the long-range uh, Coulomb potential resonances uh, analytically. And so we fit, uh, we have two reference functions that are real, so that gives us a K matrix rather than an S matrix. And then we can use all the toolbox, the whole toolbox of MQDT to, to then eliminate the, the long range ion pair channel. And so, so I won't go through uh, the details of this because either you know it or you could easily look it up. But 
what you do get in the end is a, is a long range full scattering matrix that does have these long range resonances. And um, then you can either just determine the, the accumulated phase and from the derivative of that you get the density of states. Or you can also of course calculate the, the uh, oscillator strength if you have the type of transition moments and so forth. So that's what we do. Now, why, why is the problem at H2 so difficult? You sort of been hearing about that through the day, I think, but I wanted to make a, a quick reminder. So these are, this is the, the singlet uh, Gerade manifold here, and then we have the singlet Ungerade manifold, which are the, the singlet manifolds are the manifolds where you predominantly see the effect of the ion pair potential. Um, in the discussion earlier on, we heard that, you know, maybe one could actually observe something in the triplet manifold because there's a H minus resonance that has relatively long uh, lifetimes. Uh, definitely something we haven't thought about yet. But that's, of course, a possibility. But, but for now, all the experimental observations have been in the, in the singlet manifolds. And, and so what you have here, of course, is that you have a huge manifold of curves. This is the, the ionization limit. And so you see that that uh, the dynamics at short range couples to ionization continuum. Uh, also, you have an uh, infinite manifold of, of electronic potentials as you approach the ionization limit. So you have an uh, infinite number of, of electronic states, potentially. You have coupling to the ionization. You have all these Rydberg resonances. You have non-homogeneous uh, mixing between, for, for at least for larger than zero uh, angular momentum. You have uh, sigma pi and potentially delta coupling. And so, so of course, also, actually, to just list everything that you can have, uh, Frederick also mentioned that uh, if for very high um, Rydberg resonances, you can have uh, hyperfine couplings that come into play. So there's potentially um, really a bag of heart in terms of, of physics that should go into this, um, this description. Now, luckily, it seems that we've been able to capture a lot of the trends in the experiments uh, from, from quite simple uh, treatments. And so, so far what we've been doing is that we've been ignoring the ionization and, and really just treating the, the singlet sigma states. And that, that's what we've done in both the Gerard and Ungerade uh, manifolds. So looking uh, first for the singlet uh, sigma Gerard uh, manifold where, where Wim Ubach's experiment has been happening. So now you've seen these curves a few times. We, we take our curves from, from Volnievich and also our non-adiabatic couplings from Volnievich. And you have here the the long range ion pair potential. And we simply solve now the, the close coupled equations uh, for, for the nuclear motion. Uh, so we integrate them and then we get uh, line positions which we, which we then fit to quantum defects. Um, and so these are the, the green uh, points with error bars are the uh, observations by, by Vim. And you see that, that uh, the calculated points, which are just kind of smooth lines, they, they capture the trend. So we're very far from capturing the detail, but in a way that should be very worrying because we're, uh, we're really not including uh, very much of the physics uh, that, that might be going on, but we do capture uh, the general trend. Um, now, Vim also has, um, oh, so one thing I should say here is that it is kind of surprising that we do a full non adiabatic calculation and we get these very simple curves. And seeing that um, I did a model calculation, which is this, this lowest purple line, which just, which just uh, takes the short range H, H bar potential and, and merges it with the long range ion pair potential. And it turns out that the dynamics is very much uh, um, dominated at short range by the H H bar potential in this part of the spectrum. So in fact, despite doing this kind of fancy calculation, really uh, what it shows at this point is that, that the, the overall trend of, of the positions of the lines is, is completely dominated by the H H bar uh, potential energy curve. Now, Vim also measured uh, uh, line widths. And again, in, in the experiment, there's a lot of structure but uh, he also fitted all these uh, experimental line width to, to, to a general um, uh, uh, decay of, of, of line widths uh, following the n minus 3 expected scaling. 
And we see that, that if you do that, the, the, the experiment and theory, this is the theory, they follow each other as a trend quite well. And so that, that's, again, encouraging. It means that this calculation it follows the, the general behavior, but of course doesn't capture all the detail. And I think another point to, to, to uh, consider is that uh, our lifetimes uh, are longer or our widths are, are more narrow than the experiment. And that's also very encouraging because we don't have all the continuum there. So we have uh, the dissociation continuum, but not the ionization continuum. So it would have been much more worrying to have a, 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 a shorter lifetimes than the experiment. Uh, sorry, yeah, shorter lifetimes than the experiment, since we don't have all the continuum. But but this is at least the right trend. And then this is uh, the, you've seen this plot. This is uh, now we've jumped to the sigma. Uh, seen with Sigma Ungera, the manifold, where, where Elizabeth and Robert A.K. did their experiments. And there we, we're actually, I would say, following the, the trend of the experiment even better than, uh, than in, in the Vimubax experiments. And so there's also a bit more molecular physics going on. We have these short-range uh, molecular uh, states, vibrations, uh, corresponding to resonances on the, on the sixth potential. And they, they seem to, to kind of show up both in the experiment and in the, in the theory. So this is quite encouraging. So, so I guess the take home message is that, that one can capture uh, the, the overall trends of the experiments. Now, what we've been doing here for the, for the most, uh, the last five days, Elizabeth have, has been visiting. And what we've been trying to do, I just want to give you a, a taste of what we're looking at. Is, so in um, Bob's and, and Elizabeth's experiment, they, they might be seeing um, a state which is just above, just at the bottom of this outer well here. So in a way, that state would be like the very first member of the, the ion pair state that the heavy Rydberg state then observe in this potential. And it's also a, a funny state, or funny two states, because they're sort of very isolated. So they're, they're quite long range. This is about 30 atomic units. And it kind of sits there. It would have, I think, very little coupling into the inside because it's a very wide barrier to, to tunnel through. And so it's a very sort of lonely, isolated state. And, and we've been trying to confirm that, that assignment, which has actually turned out to be surprisingly difficult in the sense that, so the story goes that, that Wim didn't see this and, and did the Landa Zener kind of a description of the predissociation of these lower states. Now, during the, using the potential energy curves and non couplings from Volnevich, we do see that actually these states are quite narrow and they, they should be observable. So that seems a kind of a robust result. But at the same time, we've been uh, the last few days discovering that, in fact, um, the, the exact position and exact width of these states is very sensitive to the non adiabatic couplings out at quite large distances. And so this is, of course, um, um, somewhat unsatisfactory and, and something that we're thinking about right now. I had a few um, worthwhile conversations with Osa and, and Xavier earlier today, and they pointed out that so one thing, of course, that, the, that there might be a quantum chemistry problem in the sense that the non adiabatic couplings are calculated in a, in a molecular basis that's increasingly poor as we move out, and so really one should probably uh, get uh, the long-range couplings from an atomic basis, and that this might be uh, a, a sort of the right way to go with actually getting the, the right position of this and seeing if that's what, what uh, Elizabeth is seeing in her experiment. So, uh, yeah, so the, there's a problem with long-range couplings. Um, and potentially, one could have for higher J uh, these non-homogeneous couplings to the uh, pi and delta. Now, that's unlikely because I think these states are quite isolated out here, and those couplings would be predominantly short range. But there's also the potential that actually they're not states here at all, and it's electronic Rydberg states. So there are many questions, but I just wanted to show you how, how difficult these kind of discussions can, can be. Now, of course, the ultimate thing would be to have a complete treatment, sort of including everything, or at least both ionization and dissociation. This is um, something I've sort of been working uh, on with, with Christian Jungen for about uh, two years while being in Paris. Uh, we're inching forward, and, and I guess my, my comfort is that, that Christian, in a way, has been working towards that for, for basically 30 years. And so uh, I guess comparatively, the progress hasn't been that slow. But, um, but the idea is essentially to use a, 
electronic MQTT, so the MQTT the way we know it, which accounts for uh, the non-homogeneous sigma pi uh, delta mixing at short range, it accounts for the electronic continuum, accounts for, for all the, the uh, electronic Rydberg effects that you can have at short range and just couple it at the long range to close couple equations. So that's, that's a sort of the dream uh, which would kind of combine what I just described to you before with, with MQTT. So we're not quite there, but we're, we're heading that way. And in the meantime, maybe we'll be encouraging to look at, at uh, heavy Rydberg molecules without ionization, and just to keep things a little bit more approachable. And so there's actually some remarkably beautiful work done by, by Hossein, as I mentioned in, in the late 90s. And so this is lithium fluoride, one of these alkali halide systems. And so we, as you see, you really have, here's the long range uh, ionic uh, ion pair potential, and then you have a covalent uh, part of the curve. So uh, adiabatically you have, this is the covalent potential and this is the ionic potential in the adiabatic sense. And you have this one single avoided crossing and uh, no, no ionization to speak of in this range and, and no other curves in the, in the neighborhood. So, so theoretically this is a beautiful system because it's so uh, isolated and pure. And what, uh, what Hossein did was that they did this calculation of the, the heavy Rydberg resonances that you get in this, in this ionic potential, and they found that this, this extreme uh, modulation of the, of the lifetime, of the width of the lines. And so, in fact, this is calculations I redid. So these two pictures are from Hossein's uh, uh, paper. This is uh, exactly like the figure in the paper, but I redid it with my code, which is always encouraging to see that you can reproduce someone else's results. Uh, I always have this kind of nagging fear that everything, you know, there's a factor of p pi 3 wrong somewhere or something like that. But, but we can reproduce his, so at least we both have the same mistake, uh, or we're both right. Um, and so, so what's interesting here is that you get this really strong variation in, in line widths. So you have quite short-lived resonances and you have quite long-lived. And that, as, as has been a sort of a theme throughout the morning, was these, these interference effects. So essentially you have two ways to accumulate phase on the wave function. And, uh, and uh, since the reduced mass is quite large, as you, as you step through the resonances, the, the interferences change a lot in character. So you get this quite interesting pattern of, of very sharp resonances and, um, and broad resonances. This, in the, in the, if you look at the photo, um, in the oscillator strength in the photo absorption spectrum, you see then uh, accompanying a pattern of Q reversals, which is, I think, quite stunning. Uh, with, uh, with Q reversals and window resonances, and so it becomes a very pretty spectrum. Now, in fact, this phenomenon is very robust, and so you get it also in a semi-classical treatment, which actually Mark Child and, and uh, Steve Chapman did in 1993, uh, and the reason was because they wanted to explain the sort of early experiments Achmed Zeweil with femtosecond spectroscopy. So this is another connection for, so in a way, Achmed Zeweil has worked on heavy Rydberg states, if you wish, and so I think that's quite neat, and I wanted to bring it up. And so what, what uh, Mark at the time tried to help explain was, was what, what uh, Achmed Zeweil was seeing. And so what he saw was that, that depending on where he centered his, his pulse, I'm sure that the actual pulse in the experiment was much prettier than the one I've drawn. Um, but if you, if you centered on, on what turns out to be these, these uh, wide resonances, you get quite a fast decay in the experiment. And of course, if you slightly move your, your, the center of your pulse, you excite the, the narrow resonances and you get slow decay. So that really, you know, given uh, what we know now, that really is no surprise. And another thing that was at the time confusing was that for a narrow pulse, you get quite simple behavior. But if you use the broad pulse or broader pulse, um, you got uh, these kind of funny recurrences, which again turn out to simply be, as we can see now quite easily, that if you have a pulse which is broad enough to encompass two of these uh, long-lived uh, sharp resonances, get a, a beating between those states. And so that's what the, the recurrence they see here. So that's quite neat. And so, so uh, Achmed Zeweil has also been in the, in the field of heavy Rydbergs. So now finally, I'm coming to the, the rubidium heavy Rydberg states. And so uh, there's a, it, it, at UConn they have a, a MOT with a ultra cold rubidium gas. And, and uh, the sort of ta task we've set ourselves is to try to find these um, heavy, heavy Rydberg states there. The temperatures are, are micro Kelvin. So really they're almost stationary atoms. 
uh, I guess the, the velocity is an order of millimeters per second. I mean, it's really fascinating uh, that you can, can achieve these things. The density, I think, correct me please, Ed, if it's wrong, but it's sort of on the order of uh, 10 to the 11. Uh, and, and you have this extremely large reduced mass. So it's even a factor two more than, than uh, this uh, chlorine that, that Frederick was speaking about earlier. And uh, so, of course, one, one idea is to, to see if you can have these heavy Rydberg states in the ultra-cold molecules. And, and something that we've been discussing uh, with the Yukon is if this could be a path towards a two-component ultra-cold plasma. So that would be very interesting. You have plus and minus atoms, essentially the same mass, more or less stationary. And, and we're working towards sort of doing now a, a Monte Carlo type of, of simulation of what the kind of plasma, what kind of properties it could, could have. But first, these, these states have to be found. So again, we, we start off with, uh, with potentials. So uh, at this point, we, we look at the signa, singlet uh, sigma g uh, manifold. Uh, the ion pair limit is up there, just below the 8p uh, dissociation. Um, and, and here, it's, you see how it, it, comes and it comes through all the potentials and gives a strong uh, ion pair character to the outer wells on, on all these potentials. Now, in our calculation, we decided to, to really focus on the five uppermost states. So we, we're skipping these two, two lowest states here. And, um, and we use potential energy curves from, from PARC and, and there's a group of, of young in, in France. And uh, we don't have any proper non adiabatic couplings at this stage, it has to be said. So we've, we've using approximate couplings, um, sort of two-state couplings at, at these uh, points that are marked in the potential energy curves, uh, trying to do uh, sort of as good an approximation as we can um, uh, of, of what the non adiabatic couplings may be. Um, and, and it should be said, of course, this, this ion pair curve here has avoided crossings, a huge number of avoided crossings as you go up in energy, but they're increasingly weak. So really, it's quite safe to ignore those higher uh, crossings. So this is a calculation of, of the spectrum, uh, sorry, that, that we've done so far. And th where we are here in energy is um, uh, essentially we have resonances uh, on, on this uh, six potential. And um, the green energy range corresponds to, to, to states which are just below this little barrier on the six potential. And so you see that in that region, uh, you have much lower density of states. And, and that really makes sense because once you get up above the, the barrier, you get a much larger uh, range for the dynamics. Uh, you can accumulate much more phase since you get much denser manifold of states. And so that's up here. The, the lifetimes that we, we seem to get are, are quite long, so to the order of half a nanosecond. And really, these states are sort of semi rydberg So uh, the, the quantum defect, if you look at it, has an extremely strong energy dependence. And there's plenty of, of interloper states. So it's quite a complex uh, spectrum. But, but there are, on the other hand, very many states uh, there. If you go higher in energy, so if you calculate states up uh, in, in this region, up above the, the final avoided crossing that we include, we, we approach a, a domain where we have more sort of heavy Rydberg states as we know them. And so, so uh, quite soon you start getting this, this behavior here with a modulated uh, line width, very much like what you saw in, in the lithium fluoride calculation I showed you. So, so uh, here you have long-lived states sort of at the order of, of hundreds of, of picoseconds. And you have this interferometric modulation with, with some quite wide resonances and some quite sharp. And, and really, if you look at the quantum defect, it has an energy dependence, but it's much closer to, to, uh, to really being called a heavy Rydberg system. And so the, the range here <coughs> for the calculation is sort of 1,400 to 1,700 uh, in principle quantum number uh, for these states. Um, so one point which I think is very nice, and that's also what was seen earlier by, by Frederick Merck in, in chlorine, is that the, um, the curves, are, the, sorry, the resonance is almost not affected by angular momentum. So you should expect very little thermal broadening. Uh, here at the, at the level of, of zero and one, uh, they're essentially indistinguishable. And so you really could imagine that, that these states are sort of uh, you know, fixed in position. And this, of course, connected to the fact that you have a huge reduced mass and a very long range state. 
Um, so that's that's no great surprise, but I think that's that's uh, you know a positive thing in the in the context. We can of, of course these calculations can be improved in many ways. So um, coming from a sort of H two perspective, I mean the the the, the number of electrons here is, is uh, abnormous. And so one can certainly work on the potential energy curves for these excited states. Uh, it would be quite nice to try to get ab initio non adiabatic couplings. Uh, one could try to take account for the spin orbit couplings, which of course are, are uh, um, relevant in, in for rubidium too. And of course, in terms of trying to predict uh, properly the, the excitation, possible excitation pathways, one would like to, to have uh, dipole transition moments. So we have, we have some uh, ideas of, of what one could do uh, to, to excitation. We see many ideas for exciting heavy Rydberg states in rubidium in the, in the previous talk. And so we've been thinking in terms of, so, so really one would like to, to maximize the, the Frank Condon overlap. And, and one way to do this uh, would be to create a Feschbach resonance which essentially you use a magnetic field to tune in the, to, into the highest uh, uh, vibrational states on the two lowest potentials, the, the sigma uh, g and the uh, singlet sigma g and the triplet uh, sigma u. And, and so essentially the, the Feschbach resonance would, would have very much a short range, very much a character of these two wave functions. And you see they, they have quite strong um, peaks at distances where you can imagine going up. So either you could imagine going up out here uh, trying to, to hit um, an outer turning point of the wave function out here. Um, probably the, the um, Frank Condon factor, which you haven't calculated yet, would probably be reasonably good. But of course, the problem is that the, the wave function, electronic wave function down here and the ion pair wave function up there have very different characters. The oscillator strength would be very, very weak. Uh, so, so another, may, maybe, and here, of course, one can also think about these uh, distances to use this kind of uh, lacking potassium uh, from, the, from the group uh, of Mushinsky and, and Tomzak, uh, the, uh, the sort of intermediate state you get from the, from the spin orbit coupling. So that's, that is, you know, one thing to consider, but another possibility is going uh, at a shorter intermediate distance where you probably have more oscillator strength going up. Um, and you get, but of course you see, if you look at the wave function up here, so even at the turning point, because the system is so heavy, the, actually it really doesn't penetrate into the ion pair potential very far, and so you have a small peak there which will give you some Frank Condon overlap with the wave function down here. And so this might be possible, and then once you're here, one could think of schemes to maybe step up uh, uh, from one Rydberg state to another, heavy Rydberg state to another, and trying to, to excite uh, really quite heavy, uh, quite long range states. Um, and one would have to have, take some care in stepping past the avoided crossings and so forth. But, but that is uh, something uh, that could be worthwhile discussing, I think. It's, so it's not dissimilar from the Pischler uh, uh, idea, in fact. So now, in, in summary, um, a dissociation only close coupled plus MQDT uh, approach will reproduce the, the general trends in, in systems with ionization. So you can sort of capture the general physics, but you certainly don't capture all the, all the detail. And, and for that, you would really want to have the ionization continuum. Um, in systems where ionization is weak or, or, or absent, uh, the limitation for the quality of this theory is simply the quality of the potential energy curves and the non other couplings. And um, in, in, in rubidium, um, we see now that, that certainly you would have this kind of interferometric line shape modulation uh, that you see in, in systems with large uh, reduced mass. You certainly would have some long-lived resonances if you just can reach them. And, and it certainly should be uh, worth beginning a discussion, a continuing discussion about using a, a, a tuned Feschbach resonance as a way to, to maximize the, the Frank Condon factor. So in terms of um, acknowledgments, there are many people to thank. So we have been working with Hossein and Seth here at, uh, at uh, ITAMP. Of course, the, everyone at, at UConn. Uh, most of the H2 work, I, uh, I had the privilege to work with Christian in, in Paris. Um, something I haven't spoken about at all, uh, but we've been sort of slowly inching towards a, a model of uh, Friedrich Merck's um, uh, experiments and, and that's been uh, all the heavy work, heavy lifting with ab initio calculations have been done by Amar Dora, who's uh, with Christian at the Laboratoire Amé Coton. 
And then, of course, uh, the interaction with experimentalists here have been uh, extremely useful. And uh, yeah, uh, ITAMP and, and Marie Curie have been generous in this project. We have time for some questions and discussion before Ed. Not really a question, but I can help you with one thing. There's yes. a, um, a fairly extensive new set of potentials for RB2 that was recently published. I believe Alouche is the first author. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's what Journal of Chemical Physics, Phil? Um, uh, so the Lyon group. It's the, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, in addition, um, uh, we've had very good luck when we have specific questions about things in involving a lot of elaborate coupling with just asking Olivier, Olivier Delieu. Mm. And if it's something specific, he'll usually send you the, um, the necessary potentials in a week or two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be very good. Adam, would you expect to see that interferon metric uh, modulation in the hydrogenic system, or is it just too light? I mean, it's just going to be much more, um, I think it's going to be much less obvious, because um, because I think the reason you get these this really beautiful patterns is the heavy, you know, with the heavier reduced, ma uh, with the larger reduced mass, you accumulate phase much quicker, and so you get quicker differences, and so you get these really sort of patterns of, of repeated uh, structures. Oh, so, I forgot, I, I mm. meant to ask you, I, yeah. I assume those oscillations are both in in cross-section and in lifetime? Yeah. 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 So, so I mean, one sees modulation in H2, but it simply sort of doesn't follow such a, yeah, it doesn't follow the same kind of easily identifiable pattern. In the uh, states that you considered for rubidium, is there a reason you didn't put in the 5S plus 5D? That's just barely above the... 5p plus 5p. Maybe that wasn't in the potentials that you were using. I think it wasn't in the potentials we were using. But one certainly should, you know. So, so this is uh, our first explorative sort of calculation, and uh, we really would like to improve. And so, so certainly, when we sit down and discuss, we can okay. we can definitely put that in. Yeah. Yes, Bob. This is just uh, a shot in the dark, but. Uh, what would microwave spectra do, or chirped microwave spectra? Would there be the possibility, not so much the spectrum, but just using a way to make up, uh, I mean, you have weak interactions, but, uh, uh, and states not that close together, you could arrange for there to be a, uh, essentially a shift into resonance. And is there a possibility of using some kind of uh, tailored microwave pulse to make up for what the nature had forgotten to do. Mm. I think that's a very interesting uh, idea. And, and that would definitely be, I think, uh, interesting possibility. Say once you're, for instance, at, at the lower end of the series to, to, to sort of then step forward, uh, further up in it, that, that would be certainly something that, that one would like to look at. So I maybe agree. you should tell us what to do <laughs> or what to provide for you. Yeah. All right, any other final comments? If not, I think I'll turn the microphone over to Hussein. <laughs> I just see that in the program, there's a sense of a wrap-up discussion before dinner. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think maybe a show of hands for all the people in the audience.